things to seven, also to eight. What, he, what, what he's doing there with the use of seven and then eight is kind of like in our common language when you hear someone saying, don't just give 100%, give 110%. Now, I never really liked that. I don't know if any of you are bothered by that, but I, I'm a little mathematical, so I'm like, well, actually, you can't do that, right? Well, that is actually what Solomon's doing here. He's saying, give everything. Give the ultimate that you can. Give, give everything that you can, and then give a little more, all right? So cast your bread upon the waters. Don't give up. Keep doing stuff. Invest your money. Work hard at your job. Go for that promotion. Get good grades in school. Gain the knowledge that you can. Have fun and enjoyment in your leisure activities. Don't stop living. And while you're doing that, that's verse 1, while you're doing that, verse 2, circle other people in. Bring other people into that excellence that you're striving for in your life. And then he tells us why um, in, in verses 3 and following. And it's really interesting what he does here. I really like these verses. He says, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. If a tree falls to the south or to the north, well, wherever it fell, it's going to lay there. <laughs> He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. So verse 3 is the idea. You can't change what's going to happen. You know, there isn't a tap that you twist on your house to make it rain on your fields, and then you can twist it off and the rain will stop. And as the folks out at Bass Lake Camp know, when a tree falls, if it's going to fall on the cabin, it's going to fall on the cabin. And if you stand under it and try to stop the fall, well, that's not going to do you any good. What's going to happen is going to happen. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. And so when you look at the chances of life, the possibilities of success and of disaster, don't allow those possibilities to make you give up, to make you stop. I uh, spent a few years working uh, for a, a Christian brother in Medelia um, who was in construction. And so we did a lot of... Um, renovation, but the biggest thing that we did most constantly is we did roofing. It was after a couple of those hailstorms that we had out. I don't know if you guys got them out here, but we had those out there. And so there were insurance claims left and right. And contractors love insurance claims because generally what happens is they go to the guy and they say, yeah, we can do your roof for that cost. Just give us your insurance check and we'll redo the roof. And the, and the homeowner's like, oh, okay, great. And they give them the insurance check. And then the contractor can redo the roof for 75% of that cost but they get the whole insurance check. Now, this isn't unethical. This is an offer that is accepted and then it is, it is made good on. All right? And so the, the, the contractors, they love the insurance check business, but then they've got all kinds of business. And so we were going from house to house to house just doing roof after roof after roof. And one of the problems with roofing is that you have a roof, if you have a roof tore off and then it rains, you kind of wreck the house. And so I would always be watching the weather and saying, Brian, it looks like it's going to rain later today. Are you sure we should tear the shingles off this roof? And he, he, he was using this passage on me left and right. I Now, it wasn't that I didn't want to work. I needed the money. I wanted to, well, I don't love roofing, but I needed to work. And so... I wanted to be able to work, but I was afraid that we'd have big issues if we had a huge downpour in the middle of a tear-off. But he said, Nathan, you just can't do business that way. You have to keep on scheduling the work and doing it, or you'll never go to work and you'll never get anything done. So he understood this passage better than I did at the time. He was also the boss, so that's the way bosses are, right? If we're going to live by faith, then we need to work hard through our lives, and we're going to follow the advice of these verses. What's going to happen will happen. And if you regulate the choices of your labor, the choices of your life, by the fear of what might happen, of what might occur, then you'll never get anything done. Man, I, man cannot control the difficulties of this life. And even if, he can't, even if he can anticipate them, and often we can't, right? We don't know what's coming around the corner. Sometimes we can guess. But even when we can anticipate them, we can't do much about it. There are so many unexpected events that occur in our lives. 
And we can't regulate our lives by these events. We just need to keep, keep pasting, casting our bread on the waters. We need to give a serving to seven and also to eight because we don't know what's going to happen on the earth. What God does and how he does it are not up to us. Verse 5 teaches that, as you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is, who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. What God does, how he does it, why he does it are all too often beyond our comprehension. It's outside of the scope of our knowledge. And according to the, to, to the book of Job, we don't even need to know why. Certain aspects of God's working on earth defy explanation. The mystery which shrouds our very origin underlies the whole of reality. We just don't know. There's a big question mark floating up there. And the way that we live our lives is going to be greatly influenced by what we do to answer that question mark. Solomon has exhibited to us two ways to look at that. The first way, the way that he has been persuading us of so often in this book is vanity of vanities. All is vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. That's what Solomon's been arguing for from his under-the-sun perspective. He's saying, hey, if all, you, if all you've got is this life that you have now, if you're going to leave God out of the equation, then all you've got is vanity. All you've got is frustration. But if God is central to your life, then you may have a life of significance. So we don't know the way of the wind. We don't understand how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. We don't know when it is that God causes, how it is that God causes the soul to meet that baby before it is born, when it is conceived. We do not know the works of God who made everything. We, we never will have him fully figured out. So, therefore, since we don't know, and yet if we believe that he is good, and that he is trustworthy, and that in his sovereignty over his times, his plans for us are welfare, are good and not evil, to bring about an expected end, then in the morning we will sow our seed. In the evening we will not withhold our hand. For we don't know what's going to prosper. We don't know how God is going to, in his sovereignty over our time, dispose of our work, whether it be good or evil, in our perspective, and yet we should still be trusting in him. So there in verse 6, Solomon continues with the illustration of farming. But his conclusion here in this section is that we need to work hard at whatever we set our hand to because we don't know if it's going to prosper or fail. But we get fulfillment in the hard work of it. That's what Sol another thing that Solomon's been saying all along, right? He said, I know that all this work that I've been doing is emptiness because it's going to be destroyed by the people who've come after me. But while I was doing it, I was enjoying it. While I was doing it, it brought me great pleasure. And I'm so glad that at least I had that. And he, he recommends to us over and over and over again that we follow the same path that he did, that we would work hard, that we would enjoy it, what it is that we do. He moves on to a different set of ideas in verse 7 and 8. He says, Truly, the light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet he remembers the days of darkness, for there will be many, all that is coming is vanity. Light and sweetness are images that Solomon's been using throughout the book, and he uses here for enjoyment in life. The lives that we have, we can enjoy them. There's no doubt that God has put enjoyment into our lives. And even if a man, in verse 8, lives a really good life, he enjoys most of his life, yet let him remember the days of darkness, because days of darkness will come. Enjoy today, because you never know what tomorrow will bring. In a merely earthly sense, that's all we've got to go on right now. Enjoy what you can today, because you don't know if tomorrow will bring difficulty and, and sorrow and suffering. 
Enjoy what you can today. Because ultimately, if we leave God out of the equation, all that is coming is vanity. There is no hope. There is no ultimate fulfillment. He goes on in verse 9 to say, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that, all, that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Now, what Solomon's doing in these two verses is he's, he's describing a circle. He, he starts here by saying, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And what he does by that is he's saying, when you have the ability to enjoy life, when you get up in the morning and you put your feet on the floor and it's not snap, crackle, pop, groan, you actually have the elasticity of youth. Enjoy your life. Enjoy everything that you can. Because God has given you this life for enjoyment. God has put you in this place because it, he is sovereign over your times. So young people, I'm not including myself in this because I do snap, crackle, pop, and groan in the morning. Young people, Solomon's recommendation for you is to enjoy your life. Enjoy it as much as you can. Because you are in a time of physical enjoyment. You are in a time when it is, it is not difficult for you, like it is for those of us who are getting a little older, to get up and go. Enjoy your life in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart. You hear, you hear him here? I thought we said a few weeks ago that Walt Disney's constant suggestion that has made its way into every nook and cranny of our culture, follow your heart, was poisonous to the Christian mindset. I said that a few weeks ago, right? And yet here we have Solomon saying, follow your heart, right? If this is the way of your heart, walk in it. There's my heart, I'm following it. That's what he says here. What is he getting at? What is he saying? He goes on to say, and in the sight of your eyes. So do what your impulses tell you to do, he says. And what looks good to you, follow after it and do it. Enjoy it and pursue it. So he, that's where he starts. If we're at 12 o'clock, let's go down to 4 o'clock for the next bit, all right? In the next bit, oh, wait, for you guys, it's over here, isn't it? All right, 4 o'clock, but, all right, so enjoy everything that you can, but, pause, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. God is sovereign over your times, and he has willed young people right now for you a time of enjoyment. And he's telling you, follow your heart, follow your eyes, pursue pleasure. But while you're doing it, remember that God sees in his sovereignty over your time. He acknowledges everything that you're doing, and he has given you free will to enjoy. And he has willed that you enjoy. But enjoy within the boundaries of obedience. And he'll develop that a lot further, and we'll talk about that next week. That's the passage that we're so familiar with. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, right? So he's previewing that here. But he, this, this, is, this is important stuff for us to know. Sometimes we, as, as the more conservative type of Christians, the fundamental Christians, the independent Baptists, we get mocked and made fun of because we're supposed to be people who, who turn our backs on pleasure who deny ourselves the gifts that God has given, who have so many rules that we can never have fun. But that's not what's being taught here. And I believe that that is a straw man of our Christianity that is made so that it can be easily burned down. God has designed us for pleasure. He has given us our five senses, and he has filled this world with all sorts of stuff that we get to enjoy with them. 
How many people in here don't have a favorite food that you just love? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't think anyone does. We all have favorite foods. I probably have many. And there's no probably about it. I certainly have many favorite foods that I enjoy. How many people in here don't have music that they love? There may be a few people here that don't care about music, but music touches most people's hearts, and most people have a type of music that they love more than others. How many of you here don't love something that you can see, whether well, it is the frost that shows up on evergreens? On a, after a cloudy morning and the sunlight hitting that frost on the evergreens and just lighting it up like no Christmas tree you could ever imagine, or the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset, or the slash of the Milky Way across the sky, or a thousand, a million other things that we could imagine. How many of us don't have things that we love to see? I could go on and demonstrate the other senses as well, but I think you know what I mean. God has filled this world with pleasures and then given us the senses to enjoy them. It is his will that we enjoy them within the context of them being gifted from him. He has made us for pleasure. He has filled us with the capacity of enjoyment. And one of the ways in which we may glorify him is by enjoying his good gifts in a context of obedience and thankfulness. And this is biblical Christianity that I'm talking about here. So are your pleasures, the way that you enjoy them and how they come into your life, are they seen by you as a gift from God and do you enjoy them within a context of thankfulness, even worship? Or are your pleasures yours and God has no part in them? Because if your pleasures are yours and God has no part in them, then I promise you, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. But if you access your pleasures as a component of God's will for your life, then you have an opportunity of enjoyment and significance that God wills. So rejoice, O young person in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. So enjoy the pleasures God has given you. 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Remember that you are accountable to God for your choices. Eight o'clock. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. So if we follow Solomon's train of thought here, he's saying since you are to enjoy the pleasures that God has given you within the context of obedience, then don't go and pursue sorrow in your life. Don't become an ascetic, a person who denies themselves pleasure and welcomes pain so that they can obtain a, a feeling of spiritual significance through physical abstinence. That's more or less what an ascetic is. And an ascetic can be an ascetic in the context of Christianity or any other religion. They're common in, in almost all religious pursuits. Don't be an ascetic, Solomon is saying. Remove sorrow from your heart, but also put away evil from your flesh. Put away evil from your flesh. Don't pursue pleasures in the context of meanness. Don't pursue pleasure in a context of a disobedience to God. Because when we come all the way back around, remember 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, we started out by saying, rejoice, oh young man, in your youth. But when we come back full circle, at the end of the day, childhood and youth are vanity. What does he mean? He just told us to access the pleasures that we can with the youth that we have. Whether, whatever youth we have. There's some of you in here who have an abundance of youth. There are others in us, of us in here who have a mediumness of youth. And there are still others who have a smallness of youth. But all of us have some youth, some capacity for various kinds of enjoyment. But childhood and youth are vanity. Because at the end of the day, it's not about pleasure. 
At the end of the day, it's not about the experiences that we had, the toys that we accumulated. At the end of the day, it's the conclusion that we will look at next week. At the end of the day, chapter 12, verse 1, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Now is the time. We talked about this at the youth retreat a week ago. Now is the time to be making these decisions. Now is God's time to be choosing his way. We all live under the sun. We're stuck here. We're stuck in a fallen world. And if all we live is with that understanding, then our lives will be full of frustration. But if we, if we include in that understanding that God is sovereign over our times, there is a time to live, a time to die, a time to mourn, a time to laugh, and so on. And he is the one who determines those times. If we have that then he will be the center of our lives and everything else will plug in in its place like the borders of a puzzle with him as the big piece in the middle. And we will be able to enjoy our youth in whatever capacity exists in us. We will be able to follow his will so that when we read verses like, but know for all these that God will bring you in judgment, we will be able to say, no, I'm not perfect. But God's at the center. And so I can enjoy life and feel good about it instead of enjoying life and feeling guilty about it because God has filled this world with pleasures and given us the senses to enjoy them. And so let us enjoy the good gifts that God has given us within a context of the fear of the Lord, within a context of obedience because he is trustworthy. And when we feel the time in our lives, when, when it feels like things are just closing in on us and we're wondering, why? Why even go on? This is all vanity and vexation of spirit. Cast your bread on the water. Give portions to seven, even to eight. Because God is sovereign over your times and he can be trusted. Father, thank you for your word and for the encouragement that Solomon brings us here. I pray that you'd convince us that you have a will for us that is inexorable. And because of that and because of your goodness and especially because of Christ and the cross that we can trust you with our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the final verse of God's refining fire.